Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Hickey. I am the Web Accessibility Specialist for Rutgers University. Uh, this is my buddy Storlax. He is helping me stay calm while I do this presentation because presenting makes me very anxious. Doing today is giving you guys a short introduction to accessibility. Uh, if you are already familiar with accessibility, you'll probably be hearing some of the more familiar things that you're used to. But the other idea is to also introduce you to more tools and tricks on how to identify accessibility issues within your websites and help sure that you become more aware and empathic of your disabled users. So I will be going over why accessibility, uh, a short intro into WCAG. Uh, I will not be going to specific rulings of WCAG. Um, these slides are also not technically updated for 2.1. This is still for 2.0, but it's a lot of the basic levels, so everything I go over is still 2.1 uh, ready. Um, I will also be introducing some of the more common accessibility issues that generally come up within websites, how to look for these issues, and then on my slides, I have a bunch of hyperlinks of all of the tools that I shared. Uh, again, if you want a copy of my slides, they're already available on the Drupal website. So, why accessibility? Uh, one of my favorite quotes here is from uh, Cynthia Waddell from the International Center for Disability Resources on the Internet. Uh, development of information systems flexible enough to accommodate the need of the broadest range of users, regardless of their age or disability. So when you're building with accessibility in mind, it's not meant to just be looking out and making sure that those with disabilities are brought in under the veil so that they can access their information. Everything that you build is accessible for everyone, regardless of their age, their location, or their disability. What we're trying to do is level the playing field so that everybody isn't struggling in order to get the information that you're presenting on your website. Um, a lot of this I already repeated. Um, so some of the accessibility issues that you might not have thought about uh, before, um, issues, uh, advantages that have been built into Common Day. Uh, who likes to read captions on slides, on movies, on anything, especially on YouTube in a noisy area? Um, you know, you have a lot of accessibility features that were built specifically for non-mouse users that were built into uh, what you use on your phone. So for example, a lot of your phone accessibility translates over to those who may be restricted to using keyboards. Um, accessibility is also good user design at the end of the day. You start building with accessibility in mind, you're making sure right at the beginning that you're thinking of your users and how they are going to use your website more effectively. Um, it's really easy to use, it makes it very efficient, it makes it very versatile, it makes it easier for all of your users. Um, also, accessibility is one of the bigger proponents for mobile design. So if you are moving away from desktop websites and you're getting into more responsive design, thinking of accessibility already puts you several steps ahead. Uh, some of the issues that you may or may not be aware of that people may struggle in terms of getting into accessibility uh, sight is one of the more common ones that people are aware of. Uh, so for example, you may have color blindness. They may be sensitive to light. They may have poor eyesight or color blindness. And this is something that can happen over time. This is something that could be at birth due to a defect or something. Um, uh, you may also have some physical issues such as being hearing impaired, such as having motor control issues or a lack of limbs. I stutter when I get very nervous, so I apologize. You're doing good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so, you know, some of these people may rely on captions. They may rely on keyboards or accessible mics. Um, you may have users that are using uh, vocal input controls, such as uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking. They may not actually be able to touch any of the devices that they're <laughs> accessing and are using computer software to get that information. Uh, you may also have uh, mental disabilities, such as learning disabilities, attention deficit, dyslexia, or even Caesar sensitivity. A lot of people forget the last one, and it's actually one of the biggest rules in WCAG, which is don't cause seizures. Um, so some of these users might use tools that turn off distractions, that disable movement, that may adjust the color so that they're able to actually intake the information you're presenting. 
Um, and then there's other things that a lot of people don't think of, such as age. Different users of different age groups work with the web differently, depending on if they grew up with it, if it was new when they were older, or you know, it's something that they're adapting to right now. Uh, it also could be they may not have access to the accessible devices that make it easier for them to take in that information, or they may not be uh, aware of their disability at all. Um, a common thing I always like to point out is that most of the people in the room are wearing an accessible device on their face. And a lot of people aren't aware that they're actually some sort of color blindness or near blindness until way later in life. Um, <laughs> also, as a side note, uh, hello, I am Mrs. ADHD and dyslexia. Uh, so I get really distracted by certain text fonts, I get distracted by colors, and I hate your rotating banners. A lot. <laughs> a whole lot. I hate GIFs, I hate rotating banners. Yeah, I, I hate rotating banners. Um, uh, depending on your institution, it may actually be legally mandatory for you. Um, uh, back in 2010, the Justice Department said that basically websites are considered public domain. So if you have a public website, you have to accommodate for people who have disabilities and not block them out of your information. Um, most agencies that are federally funded, such as Rutgers University, they have to be what's known as 508 compliance, which basically means that we have to follow their rules in order to technically be accessible compliant. Um, it wasn't until uh, a year ago that uh, the standards put forward by the Worldwide Consortium, or W3C, were actually implemented into American law, in which included WCAG 2.0 AA into their 508 standards. Before that, the last update was 1998. So, uh, so quick introduction to WCAG for those who may or may not know what it is. Uh, they are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and I always have to read it because I flip words. Um, this was uh, created as part of their Worldwide Accessibility Initiative um, to bring forth worldwide standards into the web uh, in terms of accessibility. It's the Internet's version of the ADA. Um, it is primarily the content is developed for uh, web developers, web designers, and coders um, hoping to make more digital materials. Um, the most common for words is uh, WCAG 2.0 or now 2.1 since the new standard has come out. Um, 3.0 Silver is now in development. Uh, I will advise if you want to jump into WCAG to not directly read WCAG unless you have a law degree and a lot of time on your hands because that thing is longer than War and Peace. Um, it has a few guidelines and what is known as poor built into the back of it. Um, so with, there are 13 guidelines total. I'm not going to go over them, but I will at least go over what the poor mechanics are. And it's kind of their way of understanding how you interact with the users. So is your content perceivable? Uh, is your user able to take in the information without any sort of struggles? You know, are they able to absorb the content? Can they see it and interact with it? Um, operable. Can your user interact with your content or with um, any sort of dynamic features that you have on your website without struggle. Uh, understandable, does your user get it? Can they understand the directions effectively? Do they know where they make mistakes? Can they find your information easily? And then robust, can your, act, can your user access it regardless of their device that they're using? Can they access it on their cell phone, their computer, with their screen reader, with their talk to text, with their keyboard, and so on and so forth? So those are the basic questions that WCAG asks, and then within each of those, they have several guidelines. Um, for WCAG, the way that they break it down is they have uh, three guidelines, A, AA, and AAA. And so when you are trying to reach and go, okay, I am compliant to A, I am compliant to AA. Um, for example, uh, 508 compliance is now aiming for AA <coughs> compliance, that that is the goal that you should reach. Um, usually the way I break down the A's is uh, if you are not aiming for single A, your users can't use your content. There is something broken and they are unable to get it effectively. It's not even a struggle. They are unable to get information. Uh, if you are not aiming for double A, there are speed bumps in the road. They're having issues. They probably have some hacks that they've been doing for years in order to circumnavigate whatever struggles they have. 
but it's going to take them way more time than it would a neurotypical <coughs> user. Uh, AAA is kind of the above and beyond marker. You know, you've already reached AA, you decided to get rid of all of those speed bumps and all of the, you know, the potholes. AAA is repaving the road, making sure, going those extra steps to go, okay, I know that I have this dynamic thing and I want to make sure screen readers use it. What parts of AAA can I look into to make sure that it is e even easier for them to access it instead of still having the similar struggles than they would with their device? Um, there are several offerings of information in regards to WCAG. Um, W3C has the Y overview site, um, which is uh, probably my favorite pl place to jump into WCAG. Um, they have the at a glance, which is a actually semi new thing. I think it's like only a year and a half old at this point, but it's kind of a too long didn't read of um, WCAG 2.0. So it's very simple, they have filters on there, so if you specifically want to go into, I just want to look at motion stuff, I just want to learn about color contrast, I just want to learn about how not to make hyperlinks terrible, you're able to filter through those and then dive deeper as you want. Um, it also tells you about anything that's upcoming, so if you check back, you can see the updates that they're making on 2.1, the updates that they're making for 3.0, whenever that comes out. Excited for that to come out, actually. So, okay. So here are some of the common accessible issues. But before I go into that, because it gives me a break, does anybody have any questions regarding WCAG? Question. What happens? Do you submit a web page for review and they review it and get back to you, or do they come to you? How does that work? So it's technically a self-moderation thing. That is you looking into your own content and you looking, you doing your own oh, okay. audits. Because they're not, they're not a police force. They're well, not a business to do that. that. So it's here are your guidelines. Please use the honor system to make your things more accessible. Okay. But you know they can sue you. Sometimes the Department of Education will send you like a notice that you're not compliant based on their. Yeah, but they give you a chance to comply, right? Yeah, they give you a chance to comply. So, so for example, uh, Rutgers two years ago got hit with a complaint. Um, actually, most higher educations did. Uh, um, Actually, it was right when the Trump administration came in. Uh, there was a series of complaints that came in, and like back then, it was only the 508 compliance, which was very simple, kitty level versions of accessibility, like making sure you don't have hyperlinks that you, you can see, making sure your videos have captions. And so, a lot of schools got <coughs> those complaints. And the way that happened is, is you go. You, you are under the eye of the Office for Civil Rights, and they you come into an agreement with them in which says, okay, so these are the sites we want to see you make accessible. Here is your timeline. Here is your process. Um, a lot of schools has actually have moved so fast because the Office of Civil Rights is so inundated right now, and they're very low on staff, that a lot of schools are moving so far ahead in accessibility, they're actually stepping out of their um, complaint. So for example, our school this January, we are put on uh, an indefinite hold until we can find another contract, which means I don't have to be the police force anymore, I can just be the nice help desk for my school, which I'm very excited about. Any other what kind of questions? Moving on, common accessible issues. Uh, so the biggest one that usually comes up is color contrast. Um, as a back note, uh, if you have a Y chromosome, you have a one in eight chance of having some form of color blindness. Uh, we have actually figured out in my um, umbrella staff that um, our um, umbrella department in OIT, 10% uh, uh, of, our, of our Y chromosome staff have some sort of full color blindness. Um, so when I talk about color contrast, we are looking for the, the difference in luminosity between two colors. Um, basically, the ability to see a color based on its foreground and its background. Um, this affects everybody and anybody, uh, regardless of if you have a color blindness issue, if you can't see things with light, or if you have some sort of other impairment that makes it hard to focus. Um, there are some really terrible color contrast colors, such as who, who struggles uh, reading red on black, which is one of the most common ones that Rutgers has. It is a very hard color combination for you to actually focus on and read. Um, so some of the most common places that get affected by this is 
text on any background color. Uh, this could be your tables, graphs, or charts. This could be uh, your link in hover states for your buttons when you actually have your mouse hover or your focus hover on it. And it also could affect uh, labeling with color. Um, the biggest thing that you have to rework into your brain is to not rely on colors because again a lot of people can't see the colors that you see or might not be able to see them at all so what you want to avoid is using colors to rely information um, this for web design this includes making sure that your hyperlinks are indistinguishable from the text around it um, this is the worst screen in the world. Uh, but I have these two examples here in which I made a lorem ipsum with basic blue, classic hyperlink font, and then I put it through a, um, a blue-yellow filter, in which removed a lot of the blue and made it into that purple. Can, from that distance, can you guys identify those hyperlinks? No, it's very, very hard. So you want to make sure that your hyperlinks have some sort of physical difference from the surrounding text so that people can know a hyperlink is a hyperlink. Um, I'm a big fan of the classic underline because it's, it's classic and if you underline text, everybody thinks it's a hyperlink anyway. So um, this also includes focus states. So uh, I also have these sets of buttons in which I had uh, two purple buttons and then the hover button is blue. Put it through the same filter and it's a little harder, uh, especially at this luminosity and that distance to tell that the third button is hovered. Um, so in those cases, you know, borders are very popular using insets, something that gives it a physical look of, hey, I'm about to click this thing, and that's great. Um, there's also any sort of data perceived by color and any sort of um, uh, tables or graphs that you say, you know, this information means this because of this color. Um, I usually have a fun example, but I, this is a recent one. So my husband works at Bloomberg, and he recently showed me a photo of the brand new bathrooms that they built. And to tell if a bathroom is occupied, they have a light that switches from red to green. <laughs> and he showed me that, and he's like, this is so cool, but I feel like there's a problem. I'm like, does the, does the light flip-flop? No, it just changes color. It was like, well, then everybody's knocking on a door, because you have no idea which one. If you can't see red, or you can't see green, which is the most color, common color blindness, you're not going to realize which bathroom is actually available. So it's like, it's little things like those you don't realize until you look at it and go like, huh, which bathroom's available? I don't know. Uh, so solutions. Um, the first thing I usually say early in the design phase, check your color contrast, check your color palette, what you plan to do for your foreground colors, for your background colors. Um, you can use uh, such tools as accessible colors, which is a very, very simple, keep it stupid <laughs> accessibility color checker. You give it your two hex codes, you tell it what your font size is, and if it's bold, because that's important. The, the bigger the text, the bolder the text, the less specific you need to be in color contrast. And it tells you if you pass or fail. And if you fail, it gives you an alternative color. So it will say, make this font a little darker, or make this background a little lighter, and you'll pass. So it gives you that sort of feedback, so you don't have to like throw in a crap ton of hex codes and try to figure out what you're going to do. Um, also, check your websites with a color blindness filter. Uh, color Oracle is a favorite of mine. Um, Windows, Mac, and Linux compatible. It is a complete screen cover. So uh, you pop it up, and it actually does. I think I should be able to do it. Yeah, unless it's not on right now because I had to do updates. We'll just do this live. So it completely changes um, the, the entire screen. So you can also see what your desktop looks like. It, and it gives you that ability to go, okay, you know, this is, this is how easy is this for me to read? Um, this is also my favorite tool for developers to figure out if they're colorblind. I have had three developers using this tool realize that they had some sort of color blindness. It's been very fun. Um, also, if you uh, decide to use a background image, make sure that there is either a hex or an RBG color behind there as a backup. Uh, this is especially important for people like me who like to turn off images. I have a lot of time where I've had white, uh, white text on a black background and turned off images because I was distracted and now I can't read the text because the body color is white, so I'm reading white on white. So always make sure that you have that backup. 
That will also make sure that if you throw it through accessibility scanners, which can't check the color of your background image, it won't flag it as being an error every single time. Um, also, in terms of turning off images, see what your website looks like with your images off. Um, the easiest plugin is uh, Images On Off in Google Chrome. Uh, it's a light switch for images, and you just turn it on and off, and you can see what it's like to not have any of your images. This is also a great way to check for your alternative text, because that's what it replaces the images with once you turn them off. Uh, another common issue is uh, hindering the keyboard. Um, so a lot of users that have mobility issues, they may not have access to their hands, they may not have the stillness for a mouse, or they might have lost their dongle, uh, can't use the mouse on your website. You laugh, but you've lost your dongle at least once, let's be real here. Um, so uh, some of the common issues that you'll have here, uh, the biggest one is the invisible focus state. Uh, disabling the focus, in which is the outline that the tab uses as it goes around the website. Um, this could be uh, using a JavaScript or some sort of Java to make your links only visibly different via the hover state and not actually in a keyboard state. Uh, this could also be a lack of skip navigation. Uh, skip navigations can be very important, especially if you have a very heavy top navigation and you have to imagine a keyboard user having to tab through 15 to 20 different links just to get into the content itself. Um, it could also be in a logical tab order. This is very common when you have sites, um, uh, depending on how it's responsive. The, the way that the divs are moved around, it may not be actually logical on a desktop than it is on a mobile. Um, there's also, very uncommon, but it have, happens uh, using uh, unique site commands. A lot of those commands that you're using may conflict with either keyboard users or it may actually conflict a lot with screen reader users that use a lot of different key inputs in order to access your site. Um, or you're really evil and you disable the keyboard completely and they can't do anything on your website. Yes, this is a thing I have seen. I have seen this on Rutgers based websites. Uh, so one of the biggest ones is making sure that you keep focus on your links. Make sure that people who are using your keyboard can actually see the focus state. Uh, by default in every browser, uh, the focus state is that little blue outline that appears. It's become a very common trend for a while now to disable the focus completely. Just just make it make that outline completely zeroed out so when a person taps through it, they can see absolutely nothing other than that itty bitty bitty uh, navigation um, hyperlink at the bottom that tells them what that hyperlink is. Maybe, but it's very, very small. So. The ways that you fix this, make sure your hover state and your focus state match. It's a very, very easy way to fix that solution. You can also just leave the focus state alone and just have that blue outline. Um, make sure that uh, you don't use any hover-only scripts. If you're using any sort of interactive tools in your thing, make sure that there's also a focus state built into it so that a keyboard can interact with it. Um, and also, test your keyboard focus. Go into your website, just press into it, and then start tabbing through and see where your focus state goes around and make sure that it's going from A to B to C the way that your eyes would read A to B to C. Um, also, a lot of uh, keyboard accessibility that you do really also helps screen reader accessibility. So you're doing, you're hitting a, two birds with one stone with that. But don't hit the birds. Uh, as I said before, uh, skip to content or skip nouns are uh, really, really nice functions to add to your website. It's a very good thing to put into the template. Um, it's, uh, in, in its simplest terms, all you have to do is build yourself a box, a link, and you float it to outer space with the, with the absolute position. Uh, and then when the tab orders, you just bring it back. And all it has to do is link directly to the content. Um, I've also seen uh, on certain websites that may have multiple navigations. Uh, they may actually have skip to, uh, skip to main navigation, skip to secondary navigation, skip to content, skip to footer, and gives that ability for a keyboard user to better navigate around your site instead of having to tab through the entire site in order to get to the content link that they actually want to click. Um, a, a nice thing about making uh, skip navs is it's also uh, checking off an added rule box. So for example, um, in regular A, there must be two different kinds of navigation on your website. Um, 
alternative means of finding your things. So a skip navigation is an alternative means of being able to navigate the website. Having a site map is another one of them. Having a search bar. But having that skip navigation adds that little bit so that you check off another accessibility box. Um, I'm going to take a little breather here. Do I have any questions about uh, uh, keyboards or color contrast? Question. We're internal IT. Mm -hmm. We have a dozen brands we deal with. Each brand has their own agency. Yep. How do you sell that as internal IT back out when they give you a design that has yellow background with white text on it, which we just deployed? Build it into the content. What was that? Build it into the content. <laughs> the that. problem is, is we don't control that. That's a relationship between the brand and the agency. Well, I mean, uh, this is like a common issue. This is this is a very common yeah. issue. Um, I mean, can I put it on a baseball bat and beat someone with it? I really <laughs> I mean, that's wish I, I could like do doing. the same thing. Um, one of the big things that uh, we've pushed, so uh, Rutgers deals with a lot of third parties. And um, one of the things that we've built in is uh, a rule set in which um, if there's any purchasing made, if there's any sites coming in, it's in our rules. It has to be WCAG compliant. And the we technically can't come in with a baseball bat and go, y'all need to make your stuff accessible or it's going to hurt. But we can go, cool, if you get sued, mm. sucks to be you. We get to put our hands up and go, you were warned that this was an issue. You were warned that this was a problem. If we get a complaint coming in, it falls on your head. So that's kind of the big threat that we've used. Mostly the biggest way that I've done is having those conversations early on with them going, hey, have you looked into accessibility? I've had a lot of third party developers in which the first time talking about, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then you start having the conversation, you start showing them steps of making things accessible. Um, one of the big things I'm working on now is actually an empathy based site in which they have to interact with accessibility issues. So I have a site in which you use the keyboard and then I tell them to do it after I disabled the focus. I have a site in which it changes the color contrast as you move through the site. The more that you have the conversation, the more it becomes commonplace. But the big bat is the lawsuit one. Like do you really want to do you really want to disable a user who's with a screen reader? Like you never know it's going to be that person because screen reader users aren't just blind people. There's a good chunk of people who are sighted, especially with younger users who are using screen readers now, especially Siri. Like, do you really want to be that jerk? I think it's also helpful to, sh I, I work at Rutgers also, and I sort of teach people that, is to show them a video of how it looks when somebody is looking at your side with a screen reader because people don't make the connection until they see somebody struggling with that. And also in my classes I share with them the newspaper article about the lawsuits so they understand it's a real thing. Yeah, it's one of those things that unless you're getting federal funding, you don't have the big ADA bat on your side, but anyone is, they, they were talking about in the, in the WCAG group, uh, uh, Domino's recently had a lawsuit because their site wasn't accessible. Beyonce just got hit with a lawsuit six months ago. Apple got hit with one, which that one both surprised and didn't surprise me. Um, so it's it's it, like I found having the conversation is the most important thing, and I feel that because I have to work with all of Rutgers, and we are very very siloed, and everybody loves their own things and their rotating manners. I think we I think we also have have insurance for the people who work with us so that if we get sued, we can pass that along to yes. them. Once you ask a vendor that question, then they're, they're going to be a little nervous about giving you yellow and white. <laughs> question. I have a simple question about this skip to the content link. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know that when you land up the side, you can basically use the keyboard keys to scroll the, to the content without using the tab to, to tap through all the menus. So what is, I mean, I don't, it's, it's hard for me to visualize what is exactly the, the big point of skip to content when I can just scroll down with, with my arrows. So, so I actually have built that, so hold on, let me start my map. So I can so I can start the servers because it's not fully developed, so I'm still doing everything in sandbox. And, and it, it was just pure interest because Drupal has it anyway inbuilt, so I don't need to worry about it. But I just never got what's the issue. because that's a visual thing. And so for somebody who's not a visual person, 
um, relying on screen reader, oh, you give them a one yeah. click, yeah. boom, I just got the content. Yeah, okay. so screen it's in terms of keyboard navigation, you can use the arrow keys to scroll the screen. So <laughs> I can still use the arrow keys to scroll the screen and read the content. But if I want to get to this continue to the next task button, um, their, their tabbing cycle is going to start at the, um, uh, specifically at the um, URL bar. That's where it starts. So it first tabs through all of the things they have. I have the skip navigation so I can press that mm -hmm. and then my next tab is this continue to task. So this is the empathy site I was talking about. Now it's the same site. I'm starting through the tab cycle and now I'm stuck in this menu. Mm -hmm. So I specifically can't get to those buttons unless I decide to skip through that menu. And depending on how your website's built, if it's <coughs> built properly in the way that if you have drop-down menus within drop-down menus and they can tab to those things, how many links is that to get to the content? Mm -hmm. And now you also have the side navigation. Cool, thanks. So this one is for a different input. The input is the keyboard as opposed to the mouse or... No, that was clear the input is the keyboard. I was just wasn't sure why why you need to skip the tab order is the yeah. Yeah. So you don't so you don't go through hundreds of menu links sometimes on what All right. Do I have any other questions? Yes. A very basic question about skip navigation. Uh, so tabs for top level menus, what key combination is used for the drop down? Is there a standard for that? So the standard for that is usually um, because usually drop-down navigations are made by lists. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's, it's a, uh, depending on how it's built, it could be just tabbing through, um, which isn't very accessible, but at that point it's better to give them access to all the links, uh, but also allowing for arrow keys to be able to access the menu, sort of like, um, for example, um, uh, if you're tabbing through a form, um, Radio buttons are navigable by arrow keys, and then you select what you want with the space bar. So it depends. I am very bad at developing accessible menus, but I'm a web designer, so I just make things look pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I'm looking, going through the site that I'm responsible for, and I'm tapping through the top level menus, but I can't figure out any kind of key combination that brings the drop down up. I get right. down arrow key and just start scrolling. And then I realized that, um, at least as far as Drupal's concerned, I think accessibility is, is theme-based. Yeah. And depending on what theme is either bought or used or created, when people talk about Drupal being inherently accessible, it depends to on me the it base. seems like it's, it can be very not inaccessible. Luckily, it's good. open source. What? Luckily, it's open Luckily, source. Yeah. But, but if like, but say, yeah, the theme but is you, custom, no, no, and you it need, overrides yeah. like, some of these key combinations. And, you know. Just the fact that you're looking is a yeah. good is Yeah, a good well, step. I mean, I'm, I, right now, I'm, I'm sort of the in-house Drupal guy at a large law firm. But prior to that, I was uh, running SEPTA's public website. And ADA compliance was like very, very, very big. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of, I worry about these things. So, and I'm looking and I'm seeing that key combinations that would be normally... The space bar, do you know what you think? Uh, the, no, the space bar probably yeah. would just scroll unless it's yeah. on yeah. an So, that's yeah. so we have some work to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, a good safe alternative, uh, if you want to make sure those uh, menus, which is why they have the rule of having alternative means of navigation, having a search box, that's a good one. Uh, a site map is my absolute favorite because then that's, it's still tabbing through things, but it's still tabbing through lists, and then you can see the site navigation in that way and be able to find the content easily in that form. I love site maps, because I hate search bars. I never actually know what I'm searching for. Well, thank you for the creating site maps. So. Yeah, exactly. So do I have any other questions before I continue? Cool, all right, inaccessible link content. Uh, this is the bane of my existence at Rutgers, uh, because everybody loves to use here as a link. Click here, read this. Um, inaccessible links affects everybody. Um, it, it especially affects people who are using screen readers. Um, the big reason why is uh, for screen reader users, they have the ability to list all of the hyperlinks. They have, on JAWS and VoiceOver, they have the ability to list a whole lot of things built on the website. Um, but the two most common means of navigation is to look around by headers and look around by hyperlinks. 
and so they can list out the hyperlink and jump to link to link. If you are relying on the outside content in order to read that link, well, your list is going to be pretty useless when it's just read full of click here, click here, click here, click here, click here. It's, it's always fun. Uh, my coworker is blind, so he does all of our JAWS testing. And it's always very, very fun hitting those sites, older sites that haven't tackled the accessibility. I'm like, list all the hyperlinks. And it's just here, 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 here. Um, another common link issue that you'll have, too, is um, any sort of clickable object that doesn't have a label on it. Uh, the most common issue that we see with this is um, usually the search magnifier. Uh, so um, if it doesn't have a proper label on it in your form fields or doesn't even have a proper ARIA label, if it's something dynamic, then a user will hit a link, especially with a screen reader, and not be sure what it's actually supposed to do. Um, actually, it's funny because we just recently hit, we sent in this ticket to Google Forms uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the submit button doesn't have a label on it. So he couldn't submit the form until somebody actually clicked it, and that was not the only individual element on that page. So he couldn't tell what of the three links that he interacted with was actually the submit button. Um, and then another common one are image links without alternative text. The, 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 the four horsemen of the apocalypse are your social media buttons. These are the most common places in which we see images that are you know, interactive elements, but it's just image link. It has no alternative text on it, it has no content, so the user doesn't know what it's actually supposed to be for. Um, the first thing to do with your hyperlinks is to make sure that your links are meaningful. Take the time to actually give them content. Your, uh, my biggest analogy that I usually like to say is that the links are the signs on the highway in your content, and you want to make sure that when they click that link, they know exactly what they're supposed to do without having to read all the content around it. Um, so for my example, I have the click here for presentations or the CR accessibility presentation slides. Um, and again, don't always assume that your user has actually read the surrounding content to figure out what that link is supposed to be for. Um, my other rule of thumb is always imagine that your user is like five years old, and that kind of helps. I always imagine your user has no idea what they're doing. Um, another big, not really a big problem, but something to look out for is duplicate links. Um, you don't want to have multiple links on the website, especially with different labels that go to the same location. Um, that can really confuse your users, but it also especially confuses your screen reader users. Um, and redundant links can also really slow down a screen reader user. Um, for example, the biggest issue that we see with this is especially in blog formats, the read more link. Usually in blog formats, you'll see that the header is linked, and then you have the read more link. So you have a so you have both a redundant link and a useless link. Um, so usually what I advise to my developer is pick one, and if you absolutely like need both, hide the read more from screen readers. They have the initial header link for them to be able to get to the content. They'll be able to search for that one easily. The read more link is redundant and useless, but it's become such a staple that a lot of people don't want to move away from it, like rotating banners. So. <laughs> Um, uh, the other thing that I usually advise is um, I usually don't like either of those formats. I prefer the read more about X links. Those are the best ones. You're, you don't have to hyperlink the title, um, which is usually better for screen readers, but it also means that that read more link is spelled out for everyone. So everybody knows that that link is supposed to be reading more about the paragraph below or about this software or about whatever that blog title is supposed to be about. Um, and also, do not share full URLs. Unless you are planning to print out this document, you should never share a full URL. Um, actually, here's another funny story. We have a big issue at Rutgers. Uh, so we have a security filter on all of our emails that come in and out that obfuscate the link so that it goes through if we get it from an external. So it makes the link, which could be like 30 characters, into 100 characters. And it makes absolutely no sense. So we love getting link emails in which it's just, you know, it'll be safe link and then it's obfuscated to death and beyond. So if you send full emails through, links through emails, it's, it, it's a goner. Nobody's reading that. Um, uh, another big issue that we have moving on from links is alternative texts. Uh, this is you making sure that your images are visible to people who can't actually see it. 
Um, so when I talk about alternative text, I'm talking about the alt. Uh, I don't know if I have any programmers who are still using the alternative text for notes. Please stop using the alternative text for notes. That's still a common problem I am finding. Um, so uh, the only things that are affected by this are your images and your image links. Um, so the big thing that you have to do is make sure that every, every image has alternative text. I know there is a plugin in Drupal that allows when you automatically, when you upload an image, it, the first thing it asks the user is, hey, can you fill in this alternative text? So that's the one thing I really, really love about Drupal, and I hate that the OIT site is going to WordPress. <laughs> I hate it. Hey. <laughs> I, I hate it. I love Drupal in comparison. Question. Actually, I think Google's uh, uh, is doing a good thing about forcing some, some some compliance because your site will take an SEO hit if it doesn't have, for example, uh, turn on text. Today I learned something. That's nice. Well, I just learned that a couple of weeks ago. Hey, it's, uh, hey, you still learned it at some point. Um, also, fun story about Google. Uh, if you are using, like I'm using Google Slides, you can't put alternative text on anything. I love using Google Drive, but unfortunately it's very inaccessible. Um, so, uh, the big questions I usually get is, okay, so what do we put in the alternative text? Because it's, it's hard to imagine, like you have a bajillion images and graphs, what do you put in there? It all depends on what your content is supposed to be. Um, so, if it is uh, an image that's supposed to be relevant to your content, image of. Uh, you don't need to say that because the screen reader is going to tell that to the user. You just lightly describe what it is and why it's relative to the, the content. Um, like a recent example I had was a um, person from marketing was asking me with their content, they had an article about the family, they had a photograph of the family and they're like, do I have to spell out like every family member's name? And I'm like, if you were reading this out loud to somebody, would you explain every single person that is in that photo? You'd be like, no, this is a photo of the family. And now we move on to the content. So keep it simple, stupid. Yes. Um, if it is visual decoration, it is there specifically for aesthetic. It has no relatives to the content. It's there for, for giggles. This could be squiggly lines. This could be specialized bullets. This could be like those little icons that mean absolutely nothing, but they're at the top of every page. Um, you still need alternative tags on there, but you leave it empty. The advantage of this is that a screen reader is not that has that hits an empty tag is going to ignore it because it registers that it's visual fluff. So it bypasses it and goes directly to the content. Um, if it is a uh, question in the back. What happens if you leave no alt attribute? Will that not have the same effect? If you leave no alt attribute, it depends on which screen reader hits it. So for example, JAWS will read image. Uh, VoiceOver will read the file name. Like the full file name. And that depends also on how the site is, is set up and what browser, but usually Safari on VoiceOver, it will read the entire file name. So adding the alt with empty value is so all screen readers treat the same. Exactly. And it will, uh, so the alt attribute um, is, is like adding a label. That's honestly what it's doing. And by adding an empty label, it goes, I'm just going to pass by this. This is pointless. None this of is them will say like image of and then just blank. Nope. It okay. will just, it will go straight through the content. So just imagine you have boxes with content. It will, it will skip the image and just go warm and some warm and some blah, 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 blah. And the next one will do that. Um, the most troublesome one is um, charts and graphs because you may have a lot of content in your chart and graph that you don't want to spell it in alternative text. Uh, one downside to alternative text is that it does not navigate in the same way that regular content does. I am also running out of time. Um, so um, uh, a screen reader can navigate content down to the letter by letter by letter. Alternative text is one giant chunk. They can't navigate it, they can't do anything about it, it just, it just blurts it all out at once. So if you have a lot of content in there, they're going to hear that entire thing at once and not be able to slow it down or pause it or be able to go back. They have to hear it in that chunk the entire time. So usually for charts and graphs, um, if you're trying to prove a point, put that point in the image. You know, this graph is showing x over y time. Um, this chart is showing that there was an increase in this. The reason why you're showing it to your users. If it is something in which it needs to be broken down and the data points are actually important, 
pull that out into a separate table. Bring that out so that they have something that's easier for them to navigate. Uh, if you don't specifically want to have a separate table on your page to take up more time, have it be an alternative link. Put in there in the alternative text, you know, graph showing this. Click to <laughs> click to read more, you know, click to read the data points. And then lead them to that table where they can break it down. Um, also, graphs too, um, adding tables too can be really good if you have something like pie charts and uh, line graphs in which are habitual things that we like to rely on color. If you have a table graph, then people can still follow those data points in a table instead of in the graph itself. So they don't need to go, okay, does this relate to this color? They can go, no, I can check in this, in this table here that says, you know, these are the data points. So that is another good way to help with, um, especially with charts and things that are habitually relying on color. Um, and then if you have a logo, uh, you read the logo. Simple as that. You don't need to say logo of, you don't need to spell it out that it's a logo, just read the logo. Rutgers University, you know, Drupal team. Whatever it needs to be, just read the logo. Uh, so uh, another big issue is um, one of the last ones, uh, HTML, uh, use it properly. Uh, HTML5 was actually specifically, I have that on the next slide, so I'm not jump there. Um, so, not all browsers can um, fix your issues within your HTML, uh, but especially you have to remember that a lot of your devices, especially your screen readers, they're not reading the presented data. They're reading your code. So if you have broken HTML code and you're not using proper syntax, it's going to be a lot more troublesome for them to be able to navigate it. Uh, this could be headers, this could be lists, titles, landmarks, tables, page language. Making sure that you're using actual lists for list elements, actual tables for table elements. Making sure that you do that makes the content more navigable. Um, and then also use HTML5. Um, I still see a lot of sites in which aren't using a lot of the syntax that was developed with HTML5, which they built in a lot of accessibility into the back end. So the new navigation structures, these are things in which screen readers can interact with. Um, making sure that you're using the proper header structure. Uh, again, headers are the number one way in which screen readers navigate your website. So making sure you're going from header one, header two, to header three, and imagining it like a table of contents is great for your screen reader users. Um, also make sure that you're using descriptive titles and not redundantly using your title because then tab navigation is especially difficult for screen readers and sighted users. Um, I hate trying to find the one tab from the same website when the tab is the same across the board. Um, also don't design with tables or I will hate you. Don't design with tables or I will hate you. Um, and then another simple check mark that you can do for accessibility, which is nine characters long. Um, make sure that you have the language declared in your HTML. Uh, lang, for English, it's lang equals uh, en. And that tells you that the, the page is written in English. And the advantage to that is if you declare the language, if a translator hits that page, it knows what the base language is. So it doesn't need to make a guesstimate if it's presenting a translation. Um, you can also use it on the span tags around any sort of section. So if you have chunks of a page that's written in another language, you can declare that within a span tag. So that again, it knows that this is supposed to be Spanish. Um, how to check for accessibility. Uh, so there are several scanning tools out there. Um, these are the favorites that I'm presenting that I have been using for the last several years working at Rutgers. Um, there is Axe by DQ. Um, it is a plugin for both Chrome and Firefox, but it also has its own GitHub and NPM. Uh, the library you can actually install into the back end of your development system and have it do automatic scanning. Do not ask me how that works because I am not a back end developer, so I don't know. Um, usually I advise Wave for my content developers because Wave is more of a, um, um, a lower level type of accessibility scanner. It's, it presents things in very layman's terms and it, it like, and it presents it very visually. So it's easy to navigate where the issues are on the page and it makes it really good for content developers to have this tool so that they can talk to their developers about where they would want accessibility fixed. The downside to Wave is the types of divs and wrappers that it, it puts on the website 
can make it really hard to look for issues and potentially break the design when you're looking at it. Um, there is also FAE, uh, which is a spider crawler that was developed by the University of Illinois. Um, that one, I think the limit is 100 pages, and that goes through your website a certain amount of clicks and actually presents a, a database of the accessibility issues that it finds. Um, it's also one of the most updated ones um, that's available right now that's for free. Um, and then another favorite one that I have is the accessibility bookmarklets. Um, these are bookmarklets that actually highlight different parts of your website. So if you want to see where you have your heading structure, where your HTMLs are, where your alternative texts are, what your alternative texts are, these bookmarklets just add a little bit of a wrapper that highlight all of these things for you. Um, also remember, compliance does not mean fully accessible. Uh, if you are using a scanner, if you are following any of these tools, um, you can still make a really, really inaccessible website, but still technically be within compliance. So it is very important to make sure that you use uh, manual checking because computers and even uh, the rules within WCAG can technically only go so far in usability. <coughs> you still need to do user testing for it. Um, I'm sorry if I'm rushing, I'm running out of time. Uh, if you want to do any sort of manual checks, uh, the biggest, which is the first way that I do testing is actually via manual checks before I pull out any scanners. Um, easiest checks to do, keyboard tests. Give yourself a task from A to B. Go, I'm going to start on the home page and then I'm going to use the search bar to navigate to this page and see how well you can do it while doing these things. Can you do it with just a keyboard? Can you unplug your mouse and just use the tab keys, the arrow keys, and the enter bar in order to do that? Um, can you do that by zooming to 200%? Um, again, these rules were made for 2.1. The new rule for, uh, for 2.0, the new rule for 2.1 is now 400%. Um, is, is it actually zooming or increase the font size? It's, it's physically zooming in the browser. Can you physically zoom the browser to 200%? Um, uh, if you disable the images, can you still navigate the website? Can you still read the content and figure out where you need to go? Um, and then there's the auto movement test. Is there anything on your page that is moving for more than five seconds? If it is, can you pause it or turn it off? Um, this is why banners don't pass accessibility. I really hate banners. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> um, but you have to make sure that if anything is moving or shifting or playing music, it has to be able to be paused or stopped if it's moving for five seconds. Moving infinitely does count as five seconds. Uh, if you would like to test things with screen readers, um, this is usually a big jump uh, because you using a screen reader and someone who is adapted to using a screen reader is two completely different things, but it at least gets the ball rolling if you want to hear the type of feedback. Um, Apple devices for free have um, voiceover that's plugged in. Um, that also counts for mobile devices. All iPhones also have voiceover, and I find voiceover on mobile to be way easier than voiceover on desktop. Uh, for Windows, JAWS is very expensive, and you don't want to buy it to do testing. So there is an alternative called NVDA that was made by the Australian government. Uh, it is only browser-based, it is not desktop-based, but it uses the same commands and controls as JAWS, just with an Australian accent. <laughs> um, and then if you want to do testing on an Android, there is TalkBack uh, that is uh, built into the accessibility features on the phone. Um, there is also, uh, WebAIM is kind of my favorite place to direct people, especially jumping into accessibility the first time. They're from the University of Utah. They've been doing this the longest. They actually do a survey every year of screen readers, and there's a lot of metrics that they pull, like how many people are using screen readers? What is their favorite browser to use? What is their favorite screen reader to use? Do they feel like accessibility is moving in the right direction? What is their biggest struggles? And so on and so forth. It's also a really good example of accessible graphs and charts. And then last but not least, don't get overwhelmed. I'm giving you a lot of information. There's also, it feels like a giant ocean of stuff that you need to jump into. But every little step that you take towards accessibility is a good step. Um, focus on things one at a time. Try to tackle it at the development period and don't do remediation. I found that remediation can take three to four times the amount of time to fix accessibilities than actually building an accessible site from the start. 
Um, and then realize that as you start talking about accessibility, as you start learning about accessibility, you start seeing it elsewhere. You start making complaints on other websites, you start realizing it more in real life, and it makes you a better ally for those who struggle because of inaccessible sites. Um, and I'm Christine. Uh, before we run out of time in five minutes, do I have any other questions? Question. Just to clarify for me the labeling and the link text. Um, is, you said link, label objects, but then I, somebody told me a long time ago that I shouldn't be putting titles, label titles on text links. I guess I'm mixing it up in my head, actually. Okay, so first we'll talk about content-based, like actual wrapped hyperlinks around text. You should make sure that there's good wordage in there. Right. You should make sure that's a good sign. Uh, if it is a uh, interactive object, my favorite one to use is the magnifying glass. Um, you can still use the title tag, but it is not a good default because only um, only mice can interact with the title tag. Okay. So for that, um, if it's an image of a magnifying glass um, that you put on there, you want to use alternative text because what will happen is the screen will interact with that and go, um, link, search website. It will read the alternative text. If it is a, um, a dynamic div, like an image within a div or an SVG, you can't use alternative text, ARIA labels are the way to go. Because that puts on the proper label so that it tells the user what that's supposed to be. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Back there. Um, is there any rule of thumbs or tips <coughs> to estimate accessibility, adding accessibility to your site? Obviously, it's a lot of stuff, but maybe there is a common multiplier that adds cost to to the site. Uh, is, it clear? is the question clear? The question is semi not clear. Can you repeat, try, try to repeat it one more yeah, time? Yeah, I'm trying to the figure cost, out the, like, the cost, like the overhead. Do you have a site that is not accessible yet? How much yeah, it cost? Like me? Is it 10, 20 percent of the cost? Generally? That I can't really answer because I have not been in a place to do cost efficiency because I work for a university, so I don't deal with any of that. Um, however, uh, I do have a story in that. So. We, we taught to a, a school in which they had just started with a new third party to do development. And they were like, hey, we just were aware that this is a new rule that we have to comply to. What can we do about accessibility? And the, um, uh, the third party decided to return that it would take double the time, even though they hadn't even started development yet. They were still in the initial design phase. They were like, it's going to take us two to three the amount of time to do this remediation. And they, they charged them double for accessibility. And that cost, uh, yeah, they have been blacklisted for Rutgers after that. Because we, we, tell, we tell our developers who are the good groups that have worked with accessibility and who are not because they come asking us. I was like, yeah, they, uh, they tried to walk circles around us and they're finishing their site and then cutting their contract at the end of it. Um, but I can't, I can't say cost because it's not anything I've ever done. In the efforts, I mean, it's not it's so. Does it have from our, dollars? from what we've done, our work out here at Princeton, um, depending on the issue, we might spend five issues, five hours to rectify it. We might spend twenty hours to rectify it. It depends. And it depends on how dynamic too. Like, I've I've helped with site remediation in which, like, they decided to start at the beginning and implement accessibility, and they saw that it took like. 10 to 20 percent more time for them to do it but also it wasn't within their original workflow so it was really new uh, meanwhile i've also worked uh, we redid our maps for ruckers.edu so we did a complete overhaul of that and them trying to figure out how to do something so dynamic and make it accessible took a lot of brainstorming. So there are things in that contract with those groups that like, okay, so we can make sure that there are proper labels that we're not relying on color, but you know, we have zooming issues that we can't tackle now. We'll look at this in phase two, phase three. So it really, really does depend on the final product. And also like experience plays a role, right? So the first time is gonna take a lot of time, but the next time around you already know and then, uh, you know, probably cut your time in half. It's all like about iteration of experience. I mean, it's, uh, 
And what you're asking is a guesstimate. It's not like a really scientific estimate. It's based on the experience that you have. If you don't have experience in accessibility, it's going to take you twice the time. But you're not going to get anyone to work with you. But if you get one who has experience, it will tell you exactly in this thing versus this. To fix this issue, it's going to take two hours. Or three hours. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's mostly <coughs> an average guesstimate. <laughs> Someone asks, well, you have a site with like scenarios. How much will it cost to implement the search? I'll probably say, well, if you use like a batch of solar with Google, it will probably right, but we'll probably do it in three days. With it all. Sorry, with accessibility though, a lot of times you have to go item by item, call out by call out, like how the actual site is built. Yeah, you sure, I understand. Right I mean uh, with Apache Solar it can be the same. Do you have tests? Do you have auto completion? Do you have error correction? There, there can be a lot of things, but there is like, a, if you go with Apache Solar, if it's Drupal, if you are not going crazy, it's probably going to be three days. So, something like that. But okay. okay. Yeah, it's still a very good question. It's a very good question. I've never really thought about it. Yeah. So. If you work in the university, you don't care about the time, so. Uh, I, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm under the OCR. No, we care about time. Are you publishing these slides anywhere? Or? Uh, so they are available on um, uh, Drupal Camp. So okay. uh, under my session, the full uh, PowerPoint slides, which are accessible, are available there. So. Um, if you want to share them, feel free to. Um, I also have business cards in my backpack up here. Um, I have no problem also answering questions about accessibility. Um, I'm not on any of the Drupal stuff because I'm not really much of a Drupal designer myself, and especially since my only Drupal instance I'm running to WordPress. <sighs> but, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions in regards to accessibility. You had, you had a thing that don't share URLs. Don't send URLs. Like 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 full URLs, like so HTTP slash slash. So what's to send instead? Yeah, um, a text link. A text link. Yeah. So like so a link text. Yeah, like link the yeah. URL. Yeah. So so for example, instead of me, so I said WebAIM's user survey instead of the entire URL. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this thing is like it's also SEO and the usability, right? Uh, having the you know like a text link as a keyword as opposed right. to a menu. I mean, it's also SEO, search engine optimization, and it's also use I mean, user experience. I mean, it's common sense, right? So you can when you search for it, you're gonna get that keyword. Also that. My experience has been that. common sense is the most common. Always <laughs> <laughs> imagine your users are five. I mean, clicking it is not the common sense keyword. No, no, I'm going to agree. But it's so, but it's so commonplace. It's so commonplace, click here links, because we physically, so many, especially content people, imagine that that link is actually something they physically have to click. So they feel like they have to put the direction there. They have to click the hyperlink. And it's like, I, no, it's 2018. We can move from that now. Actually, right. click here. By saying click here, you are uh, discriminating against users who use touch screen, a speech, <laughs> speech over, or they use their eyes to access a website. So it's like there is some form of discrimination by saying click here. That is also true. Thank you.